Hey, good morning, everybody. It is great to be with you. Today, we finish up the series, Blessed. And Jesus finishes up the Beatitudes in a strange way, a way that's kind of hard to hear and a way that seems just foreign to us because it's not what we think of as far as a blessed life is concerned. We're in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, and let's just walk through the Beatitudes because they all flow together. They, they all are one big, huge portrait of the family of God. And let's just go through them again. Let's see what Jesus said. Jesus said, first of all, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is how it all begins. This is how our walk with Christ begins. It, get, it starts when we realize that we're poor spiritually poor, and we have nothing to offer God. We, all we have is debts relative to God, and we realize that we can't save ourselves, and he's our only hope for salvation. And that leads to the next one, which is the emotional way to that, is that blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And when we realize our guilt and the weight of our guilt and that we can't save ourselves, there is this huge weight, and it it moves us to reach out to God and just in, in humility cry out and say, please save me. Jesus, save me. And it changes everything. And we start to change on the inside. And that's what happens in number three. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And that's a change of attitude. Basically, we give up the James Dean attitude. And the chip comes off our shoulders. And that rebelliousness in us begins to die. And we're open to doing the Lord's will. Because meek means power under control. And now we're willing to be under his control and his leadership. It's all about lordship. And that leads to the next one, which is all about righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Now we're interested in doing life God's way. We finally have a heart for it, but we really don't know what it is necessarily, and so we have to learn. We do Bible studies, and we go in small groups, and we're challenged in church, and we do devotions, and we learn what does righteousness look like? What, is, what does God want for us? And then as we learn those things, we put them in place, and we start to grow. We start to become like Christ, and we're changed, and that leads to the next one. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Because we've received so much mercy. God saved us when we so didn't deserve it. And because he came and comforted us in our despair, we want to pay it forward. We want to help others in their despair. And we come alongside people, and we want to be with them in their trials and hardships and their pain. And basically, our life now takes on this this mission trip kind of flavor, and we're here to make a difference, and our sphere is expanded, that other people start to matter, and it's really cool. Blessed are the merciful, and that leads to our next one. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. God knows motives matter. God doesn't just look on the outside, right? He looks at the heart, and how we think and how we approach things really matters to him. He wants us to have a mind of Christ, to think his thoughts after him. And he wants us to be motivated like he is out of love. And slowly on the inside, we're becoming new. We're becoming like Christ and we have his motives being pure in heart. And that leads us to where we were last week. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. We take on the family business. We're so excited about what we got, what we've received from Jesus. We want others to have that. We want them to have the peace. We want them to have the forgiveness. We want them to have the joy. We're so excited about Jesus. We want to share him, and we want other people to have peace with him like we have peace. And so we're peacemakers. It's evangelism, and we're now his ambassadors out there, making a difference and proclaiming him and helping people come to Christ. But that leads to today, and this is the surprise one. This, is, <laughs> this can be hard to hear, but this is what he said. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, notice what he says. It's the same blessing as the first one, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's like bookmarks. Our book ends, in a sense, that, that come around the eight of them, make a complete package with the blessing for the first and the last being the same. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now hear that, because theirs is again emphatic in all of these beatitudes, meaning 
for theirs and only theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's a bit terrifying and sobering when you think about it. Because Jesus is saying, hey, if you haven't been persecuted, if you haven't struggled and suffered for your faith, for living for him, you don't have a real faith. You're not really there. You're not part of the family. Persecution comes with Christ, comes with knowing Christ. And that can be hard to hear. But because it's so hard to hear, Jesus says it twice. And this is the only double beatitude. It's the only one with a double blessing. Notice what he goes on in verse 11. He said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Wow. This is one of the things that Jesus is really careful to get up front with all of his believers. It's like, hey, you need to know this before you buy in, before you really become one of my followers. You need to understand what it means that persecution comes with the package. He wants you to see all the spots on the dog before you buy the dog. And he, he does this over and over again. And for instance, in John, notice what he says in John to his followers. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. <laughs> I came first. He says, and if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. And notice this, that is why the world hates you. And I know, hard message but true. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, well, that's an interesting statement. If they, did they persecute him? <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, think about this. Jesus was perfection, right? That's what we believe. He absolutely was perfect in every way. For the first time, the world experienced perfection. Someone who actually is living out life the way it should be lived out. And how do they treat him? What do they do to him? Well, he was under constant pressure to change his ways, say different things, do life the way they wanted. There was all of this pressure to conform and be like the world. But he refused. He says, if they persecuted me, and we can say, oh, yeah, they did. In fact, it went all the way all the way to death. They hung him on the cross for his views. They hung him on the cross for being different. They hung him on the cross for being perfect. They couldn't stand him. His life judged theirs. Not that he had to say anything. Just his existence and the way he did things showed them that their lives fell so short of what it really should be. He made them feel just so inadequate Yet they had to get rid of them. If they persecuted me, and they did, notice what he says, they will persecute you also. So if they persecuted me, yes, they did, then they will persecute you. That's a promise. If they obeyed my teachings, they will obey yours also, and not many did. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. So Jesus is saying, hey, listen, Persecution comes with the territory. Knowing Jesus is knowing persecution. Now, we got to be careful about this. I, I, I don't want to be weird about this. I, I don't want anybody chasing persecution, seeking persecution. We, we don't want that. And, and, and we need to be persecuted for the right things because what he said is, blessed are you when people persecute you because of righteousness. So this is not persecution for being weird. This is not persecution for being mean or obnoxious. This is not persecution for, 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 for other things, ju being judgmental or whatever. It's persecution because we're actually being like Christ. And when we are, we are persecuted like Christ. Not because we chase it in some weird masochistic thing but it just passively comes our way. We don't, we don't seek it, right? But it seeks us. And Jesus says, hey, 
Blessed are you, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. And then he gives us another blessing below. And what does he say in verse 12? He says, rejoice. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What is he saying? He's saying, get excited. This is a ball game kind of excitement. This is, this is where you put on the blue body paint and put that wig on, and you jump up and down at the ball games. That's what that word rejoice is. It's a celebratory just come out of your skin and get crazy excited and celebrate. He's saying, you should, you should be like berserk happy and joyful, bouncing up and down and singing and rejoicing when you're persecuted. That's what he's saying. Rejoice and be glad. Why? Because when we're persecuted, there are rewards. He's saying, great is your reward in heaven. It's not here. Don't expect it here. But when we get to heaven, Jesus is saying God compensates for persecution. He not just compensates, it's great is your reward. Maybe more than compensates for it. So he's saying, hey, listen, it's going to be worth your while. It's, when you get to heaven and you look back, it'll seem trivial compared to how he blesses and honors it in heaven. And then he says this, not only great is your reward in heaven, but he says this, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Basically he's saying when you're persecuted, you're in great company. Because this, this has been the history of the family of God. You, you know Jewish people have been persecuted. You get that idea, right? <laughs> All through history, God's people have been persecuted. And, and, and the prophets especially. The, the one prophet in the Old Testament that I always think of when I think of persecution <laughs> now they all were persecuted, but the one that really troubles me is Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was a godly guy. I mean, you read the book of Isaiah and you're like, wow, what a great guy, a godly guy. Well, he, he was persecuted. They, they couldn't stand Isaiah, Isaiah. They couldn't stand his message. They couldn't stand that righteousness. And so they sought him in two. Imagine. Imagine being sawn in two because of your faith. Well, all the prophets, all the Old Testament were, prophets were persecuted from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, everybody. And it didn't stop. In fact, the New Testament prophets were persecuted as well. Every one of the apostles died for the faith, except one, John. But it wasn't because they didn't try to kill him. They did. Uh, Tertullian tells us that, that they tried to boil him in oil, but they couldn't hurt him. It was like this miraculous thing that, that John just lived despite how hard they tried to kill him. But all the other ones died for their faith. Peter died on a cross, and, and, and they threatened to crucify him, and he begged them to please let him be crucified upside down because he didn't think it was worthy for him to die in the same way that his Lord and Savior died. So Peter was crucified. <laughs> Paul... Paul was beheaded by Nero. In fact, Christians during Nero's time, wow, we can't even hardly imagine. He would, he would put Christians up on poles as street lamps. He put them up on poles at night and set them on fire to light up the city of Rome. He would, he would sew them up in animal skins and throw them in the arena for wild animals to tear apart. Christians have died for their faith through the centuries, and they're still dying today. In fact, if you're really paying attention, you know Christians die in Nigeria now. Nigeria is one of the hot spots for persecution in our day, and they die for their faith every week. A lot of these really extremist Islamic countries kill Christians, and if you come to faith, you're disowned by your families, and it's, it can be even considered an honor killing. Communist countries hate Christians. So this is not something that's just in the past. It's right now. And he's saying, hey, you need to realize something. You have to have a different perspective that, hey, down the road, it'll be well worthwhile. That there will be this great reward in heaven. But also, you're kind of a part of a circle now. You're, 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 you're swimming with incredible people of faith. You're, you're rubbing elbows with, with some of the greats. You're now in good company, he's saying. And so he's saying, 
This is not something that we should be sad about, right? That's not the words. And again, <laughs> I'm not saying persecution is fun. It's not. But the other stuff, the other stuff more than compensates for it. And so we should feel blessed. I know it's strange, but that's what he tells us. And notice, notice that persecution isn't just martyrdom. It's not just dying for your faith. It's not just being sawn in two or, or crucified upside down. It's, persecution comes in all flavors. In fact, Jesus tells us three types of persecution in verse 11. So if you wonder, well, if this is so important that, that basically I have to be persecuted, if I'm a real believer, I'm going to be persecuted, how do I know if I've ever been persecuted? How do I know whether I'm really in the family of God? How do I know that, hey, I'm in good circles here. Well, he tells us. He tells us three aspects, three, three variances of persecution. And notice what he says. He says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. So three things. So what is, what is persecution? So the first one, he says, blessed are you when people insult you. So the first one is insults. And, and what that word means is basically people talking bad about you. People saying stuff. And it could be to your face, right to your face, all, all hot and bothered and just, just lashing out. But it could also be behind your back. It can be in secret. That's typically the way it's been for me and my family. My family has lashed out at me and, and insulted me. I, I, I've, been, I've been told that, that I am too crazy about this religion stuff, that, that, that I, I am way too extreme, way too involved. I take it too seriously, and, and, and I, I'm making way more of it than I should. And they talk about me behind my back. That's expected. We should be insulted. So, you may have friends that deride you or make fun of you, snidely call you a virgin. You may have people that, that call you a goody two-shoes or a boy scout or too good for the rest of us. You can have people actually call you a misogynist or a homophobe or, or, or basically right now in our culture, we're being accused of creating all the tension and all the conflict of all history. We're the troublemakers. We should expect to be insulted. And it may be all polite and politically correct insults, but it's still, you feel it. And you can tell people just don't think you're doing right and they're talking about it. Insults. So if you see that, if you see anybody talking bad about you because of your faith, because you're too good for them, or you no longer can be with them, or you no longer can do the things you used to do with them, you should rejoice. You actually should, again, put on the blue paint, put on that crazy wig, celebrate, and really get excited about it and say, wow, this is it. This is great news. I'm part of the family of God. I, I, I'm not only part of the family of God, but great is my reward in heaven. And now I'm in good circles. I, I'm among the greats of the faith. I've been persecuted as well. So the first one is insults. The second one is exclusion. And I said word persecution. That word means to harass, harass to the point of sending away. It's the idea that you're not welcome here anymore. And it's, exclusion comes in, again, all shapes and sizes. You may be troubled that, that people don't tell you the same jokes that they tell others. They can't include you in them. They don't feel right telling you the same things they tell others. Or maybe you can't be in the same chats or, or the, rain, the same text strings, and, and they just won't let you in on it. And, and, and if you ask them about it, they say, well, I didn't think you'd enjoy that, or I didn't think you wanted to be a part of that, or I didn't think you'd think that was funny. And all of it's true. But that is exclusion. That's what Jesus is talking about. You don't fit here anymore. You don't belong. In fact, we won't have this conversation with you around. We'll wait till you're gone. And so you won't be invited out after work, potentially. You won't be invited to the same parties and get-togethers. You, you won't be included on the things that they do because they don't feel right having you there is what really it is about. Because... They see you as holding them back. 
And so you're excluded. And we're all excluded. All excluded as believers. Now, the ultimate exclusion, <laughs> the ultimate exclusion is exclusion from this world and from life, which is martyrdom, which is what Jesus eventually experienced and many others have. But there's all levels of it. You don't belong here. You don't belong in this forum. You don't belong in this committee. You don't belong on Facebook. You don't belong on Twitter. You don't belong in any of these places anymore. You're not welcome anymore. Exclusion. Now, if you look at your life and you can see that, even in a small way, that should encourage you. <laughs> Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And, and in the same way, they per persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so you're in good company. It's a sign of the kingdom. It's a sign that you're in Christ. And then the last type of persecution he talks about is slander. He said, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Falsely say all kinds of evil. So this, this is stuff people are saying. It's not even true. It's not even true. Now, this can be one of two ways. This can be ignorance where they think it's true, but they're wrong. <laughs> or it could be just meanness. They don't care if it's true. They know it's not true, but they're just trying to hurt you. So historically, we as Christians have been lied about, and we're still being lied about. We used to be called cannibals. Do you realize that? One of the, one of the things that the Romans persecuted the Christians for, one of the things they said about us is we're cannibals. Why? Because we do the Lord's Supper. We actually talk about eating the flesh and drinking the blood. Now, for us, it's symbolic. We're not actually sitting down at a table and eating flesh and blood. But they don't know that. <laughs> They've never been there. And so they hear us talk and they say, they're cannibals. They're eating flesh and blood. We don't. Another one they've accused us of historically is they accuse us of being atheists of all things. How absurd. But in their perspective, we are. Because, hey, in Roman times again, how many gods did they have? Hundreds, right? They had a god for everything, and you had to worship them all. And Christians had this crazy thing of just one. And he was a guy. He wasn't even a god. And so they say, you're just atheists. Compared to us, you don't have religion. You're just atheists. Now, none of it's true, but that's the point. It's slander. It's saying things that aren't true. So in our culture, I hear stuff like this all the time. I, I, I hear crazy things that I, I hear your church is a bunch of swingers. What? Because we talk about love and they can't imagine love without sex. I, I've heard we're a cult. That, that, that I've heard lies like the elders know the tax and get the tax returns of every person in the church so they can know how much they need to tithe. Lies. Uh, crazy things are said, and it's, sometimes it is it's out of ignorance and they just don't know better. But sometimes it's not. Right now we're called homophobes, right? We, we hate people. We don't. In fact, we... Of all people on the face of the planet, we're the ones that truly love these people, love all people. We have a problem with sins, but we love the person. This is a problem. If you know of people saying something about you and it's crazy absurd, what? Rejoice and be glad. For great is your reward in heaven. And in the same way, they treated the prophets who were before you. So it's a good sign. So what does this mean? What does this mean? As, as we look at this double blessing, the only double blessing, the only double beatitude, where he has to tell us twice because it's such a shock, what does this mean? Well, it means the same as every other beatitude. The same three points, and you're probably getting sick of them, but they're so true. We have the same three truths that go with every one of these eight beatitudes. And what's the first one? This is who we are. This, this is our family DNA. This is our identity. This, this is who we are in Christ. And you should see it. You should see persecution. And if you don't see persecution, you should ask yourself the question, why? Why don't I see any forms of these three persecutions, even the more mild parts of them? I should see something. And if you don't, you need to ask yourself the question, why? Is it because I'm really not a believer? This is the problem with persecution. Because it's not fun, we shy away from it. 
we actually shrink from persecution. And sometimes persecution achieves its objective. We're actually silenced by it. They, we allow them to cancel us because of the fear we feel about persecution, that someone may not like it, I might be kicked out of this, I might lose my job, I, whatever. And we shrink back from it. So there's a possibility we're not saved, but the other possibility is we're, we're being a coward. We're, we're basically disowning our family, our true family, to fit into somebody who doesn't like us anyway. To, to belong, to, to fit in, to be like the world. And we're compromising our faith. And we're not being obedient. We're not living the way Jesus told us to. And that should terrify us. This is who we are. This is who it, what it means to be a Christian. We need to own this. We need to have the courage to say, hey, persecution is a way of life. We should expect it as a believer. And we should have the courage to shoulder it and, and handle it like Jesus handled it, like the apostles handled it. Don't shrink. Now, don't chase it either. Don't hear me wrong. But when it comes our way, we take it. And we try to use it to proclaim Christ, to be different, to get even a, a greater voice, to be like him. This is who we are. And because this is who we are, this means we need each other. We need support. We need family. A lot of us, our family in the world, we don't have a place in it anymore because they're not believers. Now, sometimes you're blessed with a Christian family. Oh, praise God. But a lot of us don't have that. That means we've lost our family. If they don't get us, they don't understand us. They're the ones that are insulting us and excluding us and slandering us. Which means we need a place. We need people that get it. We need a family. We, need, we all need a church. We all need a small group. We need a place to, where we can feel like we belong, <laughs> that we're not crazy in, and, and laugh and be supported. This is why Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, I believe, says this. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. What's that? Living like Christ. Being mercy givers and, and, and being righteous and, and being peacemakers. It leads to persecution. We need to spur one another. We need to have an environment to encourage each other to live up to their faith. Not giving up meeting together. <laughs> and this has been hard, especially this last year with COVID. We, we need... We need <laughs> to realize we've lost a vital habit in our life, an important habit, a habit of coming to church. And as the vaccine gets out there and as we get more freedom, as numbers improve, we need to be very intentional of getting back into church because we need each other. We need our small group. We need the support that we offer each other because we all have been there. We all know what it means. And we need to be encouraged, which means putting courage into us to face persecution. Encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. And as the day approaches, as Scripture talks about the day when Jesus comes back, the description is persecution increases. It doesn't get less. It gets worse. So we need each other more and more. What does this mean? This is who we are. This is, this is our identity. We will be a persecuted people, and we should own it. We should not shrink from it. We should have courage and face it. But the second thing this means is this is who we're becoming, and this is huge. As we mature more and more, <laughs> we can't fit in. As we mature in the faith, this is what happens. You find less shows you can tolerate, less shows you can watch. There, there are less songs you can listen to. There's less lyrics that you can sing. There's less video games you can play. There's less new hip things that you feel like you can be a part of because they just seem weird or they seem strange or you just, they don't feel right. Some of them are just downright evil and we just can't do it. This is sanctification. This Believe it or not, this is not you becoming a fuddy-duddy. 
<laughs> this, is, this is not you becoming an old fogey. This is sanctification. This is becoming like Christ. And as you become more godly, as you become more righteous, as you become more like him, you should struggle more and more to fit into the world. You should feel more and more like you only belong on the island of misfit toys. That's the only place you feel like you belong. But that's the way it should feel. That's what normal really is for a believer. This is what Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. He said this, in fact, so it's, it's a tried and true, absolute fact. Everyone who wants to live a godly life. So if you decide I'm going to be like Christ, I'm going to live the life that he has for me. I'm going to walk in righteousness. I'm going to walk in his ways, right? Anyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, what? Will be persecuted. Count on it. And so the more like Christ you become, the less able you are to fit in the world. And again, if you're not finding that, you've been a believer for a long time and you have no problem fitting into the world, you should start asking yourself some hard questions. Why? How have I compromised my faith that I'm so comfortable in the world? Because this is not your home. You do not belong here. And it should be becoming more and more evident that you don't belong here. Because this is just the way it is. We are becoming more like Christ. This is not our place. This is who we are. This is who we're becoming. And then the third one, and this is the one I'm <laughs> most concerned about, because this is the one that's going to seem the craziest of them all. But trust me, it's true. This is where fullness lies. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying a beating is fun. And I'm not saying it's fun to hang on a cross. And I'm not saying it's fun to be sawn in two. Please don't hear me wrong. But there's something about persecution that God is there. And he's with his people that are persecuted. And in it, believe it or not, there is joy. There's this fullness. And I know it sounds crazy because a lot of us have not been persecuted to that extent but this is the evidence over and over for those who have. For instance, there's a story in Acts chapter 5 that has blown my mind forever. So, so the disciples are now basking in the glory of Jesus' resurrection. They are so excited. They, they've gone from total defeat when Jesus died on the cross and was buried in the tomb. They, they were miserable wretches. They were, they were defeated and, and just beaten. And then Jesus rose from the dead on Easter. <laughs> and not only did he rise from the grave, he proved it over a 40-day period, appearing to hundreds of people. He proved that he was alive. And it totally changed the disciples' outlook. Now they realized what it was all about, and they felt victorious, and they wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. Partly because Jesus told them to, but also because this is good news. Everybody needs to know. Everybody needs to have what we have. And so they're telling everybody about Jesus. They're proclaiming Jesus. Well, their government doesn't like it. The government of the Jews, they had a, a court, court of the Sanhedrin with 70 judges. It was their government. Well, they arrested the apostles for talking about Jesus. And they brought them before them, and they gave them a restraining order, a cease and desist order. They said, stop talking about Jesus. And then released them. And what did they do? They kept talking about Jesus. And so the Sanhedrin hears that these guys are still doing this, even though we told them not to do it. And they get upset, and so they arrest them and bring them back in. And they say, hey, we told you to stop talking about Jesus. And they said, oh, well, God told us to, and he's bigger than you, so we're going to listen to him rather than you. <laughs> and so the Sanhedrin doesn't know what to do with these guys. So they finally decide to beat them, warn them, and send them on their way again. So they beat them. They beat the apostles, strictly warned them again to stop. And notice their response in Acts chapter 5, verse 41. Notice what the verse actually says versus what we think it says. It's the apostles left the Sanhedrin, and what's the word? Rejoicing. That's that same word we looked at earlier, the jumping up and down, celebrating, joyful, just exuberance. This is party time. 
It, it's like your team just won the Super Bowl. This is, this is huge. This is not a fake thing. This isn't just some grim smile. These guys are like, woohoo! We have been persecuted. Notice what it says, rejoice, because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. How is that possible? How, how does that make any sense? It doesn't to us. Our mind doesn't, doesn't grasp that. We can't get that because we've never been there. But this is where fullness is. And I know it defies logic, but look at these guys. They've been beaten. And rather than shrinking down and being like a beaten puppy, they're exuberant and excited, and they want, they, they're going to tell even more people now. They're pumped up by it, not torn down by it. We should realize this, that yes, persecution, it's no fun. But God is in it in a way that we can't imagine. There's fullness in it. There's this guy named Samuel Rutherford. Samuel Rutherford was a Scottish pastor, and he's proclaiming Christ. He's preaching the good news, and guess what? <laughs> he's persecuted for it. So they put him in jail, and they put him in jail for six months for proclaiming Jesus. This is what he wrote from jail. Notice his words. He says, I never knew by my nine years of preaching so much of Christ's love. He says, I've never experienced God's love like this. I've never had a sense of his presence and power in my life. All of those nine years of preaching the gospel, you would think I would have had a sense of God's presence to this extent, but I hadn't yet. As he taught me in Aberdeen by six months of imprisonment, meaning the joy that I had in prison far exceeded anything I had proclaiming his word outside the prison. He found something there. I know it's crazy, and I know it sounds absurd, but he had a greater sense of God's presence in jail than he did out of jail. How is that? God honors it. God is present. God is in it. He's with those who are persecuted, and we actually can find fullness in it. Later, Samuel Rutherford, after he figures this all out, is going to put it this way. So he's out of jail, and he's trying to describe this experience of what it's like to be persecuted, and this is how he's going to sum it all up. He says, Christ's cross is what we're called to carry. Take up your cross and follow me, right? Christ's cross is such a burden as sails are to a ship or wings are to a bird. <laughs> Think about that. Christ's cross is such a burden as sails are to a ship. Are sails a burden to a ship? <laughs> In no way, shape, and form, right? They're what liberates a ship. They're what allows it to move. It's the anchor that holds it back. And what about wings to a bird? No, it's, the wings are what liberates a bird to fly. He's saying there's something happens when we take up the cross and we follow Jesus and we embrace, not, I'm not saying to sickly, masochistically chase it, but when we don't shrink from it and we embrace it and we go through it, God is there in some way that we can't even begin to fathom. And there's liberty in it. There's freedom in it. And it's powerful. Let me give you one more example because I know this is the hardest one to believe. Paul. Of all the people we know in the New Testament who was persecuted for the faith, Paul had a running list. In fact, he doesn't shy away from sharing it with us. He, he, he went through so much persecution for following Christ, for being obedient. And even after all that, notice what he says to the Philippian church. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. Now, that's something we can relate to, the power of his resurrection. But he goes further. And participation in his suffering. Becoming like him in his death. Why would anybody wish for that? Why would anybody view that and say, man, I just want more of this. I want, I, I want to experience Christ more, not just his resurrection power, but I want to experience more of what it's like to participate in his sufferings and become like him in his death. Wow. Who in their right mind says those things? It's people that have been there and have experienced persecution at its worst. And in the midst of it, they found Christ was right there with them. And even in their persecution, they could find joy.
They could feel his love. They had this actual spiritual worshipful kind of thing going on. And I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. This is blessed. In fact, it's the only beatitude that's doubly blessed. And remember what blessed means. It means it's favored. It has its roots in the word happy. This joy thing, as one scholar put it, it's more akin to delight. And as you read Samuel Rutherford and you hear Paul and you hear the apostles, hopefully you can see that, that there's something powerful in it for us. As we face it and as we endure it, God's there in the midst of it and we can actually bloom in persecution. Let me give you one more example of persecution. There was this preacher, famous preacher. His name was John Chrysostom. And he was John the Golden Mouth. He was an incredible preacher of his day, and he was persecuted. In fact, the Empress of Rome <laughs> was fed up with John because John had no problem telling everybody that we all were sinners and we all needed Christ. So the Empress of Rome decides that she's going to banish him. And notice Notice the conversation that they have and the courage and the boldness he has in the face of persecution because he knows what it's like. She says, I'm going to banish you. And he says this, you cannot banish me for this world is my father's house, but I will kill you, said the empress. No, you cannot for my life is hid with Christ in God, said John. I will take away your treasures. No, <laughs> you cannot for my treasure is in heaven and my heart is there but I will drive you away from your friends and you will have no one left. No, you cannot. For I have a friend in heaven from whom you cannot separate me. I defy you, for there is nothing you can do to harm me. Wow. That's where we need to be moving towards. And I understand that we're all not as mature as John yet or Peter, <laughs> or, or any of these greats of the faith. But we should be moving towards this and realize that God's looking for us to be bold. He's looking for us to be courageous. And as we face this persecution, he will be with us there, and he will honor it, and he will comfort, he'll reward us later. <laughs> and when we do, we're swimming in great circles, a great school of fish, a great group of people who have come before us and have boldly faced persecution and endured. I believe there are probably two people this morning as we talk about this. I believe there's one group that is like, oh my. I, I have so, so been afraid of persecution that I've allowed the world to keep me quiet. I've been so afraid of persecution. I haven't shared my faith with my friends even. I haven't, I've never posted anything about it on Facebook or anywhere else that I am. And, and I have really hesitated. I, I'm one of these kind of guys that won't even lift my hands in worship, afraid that even other people will make fun of me. I'm so afraid of being out there and being different that I, I've compromised my faith. And I know that's scary. And all of us can experience that and have known that and experience fear and have hesitated and have sh shrunk back. But the good news is this, is we're all growing. And, and, and every sin, everything we do can be forgiven. We just, we got to repent of it. We got to turn our back to it, right? We got to change our mind about it and realize persecution is a, is a way of life for Christians. And, and it can change today. You can, you can turn your back on that fear today. And you can start asking God to give you the courage and the boldness you need to face this and live in it and even find fulfillment in it, believe it or not. It doesn't have to stay that you're silent because, listen, long down the road when you're in heaven and you're looking back, your greatest regret will be because when you see all the rewards and you see all the saints that have this testimony, your greatest regret will be, I wished, I wish I didn't stay silent. I wish I spoke up. I wish I had the courage to be who Jesus called me to be, regardless what the world said. You can.
Pray, seek his face. You can do that today. The second group, the second group of people today are those who have faced persecution. I, I know here in America we have, we have persecution, but it's nothing like other places in the world. But yet you have faced that persecution and you, you have, you've shouldered it. You've, you've lived in it and you're like, okay, I've done that. But even with that, you're wondering, because I know we all do, what happens if I ever face real persecution? What am I going to do in this nation if it ever comes and, and my life's on the line and they threaten my kids or they threaten my job? What will I do? Here's my encouragement. This is what I tell you. If you have been faithful with little, I believe you'll be faithful with much. If you've shouldered the persecution that's come your way and you've boldly endured and, and just accepted it as your lot as Christian, then I don't believe for a minute you won't handle it well when it comes. In fact, Jesus, when he was talking to his disciples about this, so this is for you as well, this is what he said. He says, when you're brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, he's talking about persecution. You're being signaled out. You're going to be judged. You're going to be questioned for your faith and what you're doing. He says, when you're brought to those situations, notice what he says, do not worry. One of the things we can do is, I don't know if I'll have the courage in that moment. I don't know if I'll have the faith in that moment. And notice what Jesus says. Do not worry. That's tomorrow. Do not worry about tomorrow, the things you'll face tomorrow, things the hypothetical down the road. Don't, don't worry about that. In fact, he makes you a promise. Do not worry about how you will defend yourself or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Remember I said that Jesus is in it when we're persecuted? This is another proof that, that God says, when you're persecuted that way, you've stood up for your faith, you boldly spoke out, so you have, you've dealt with persecution already to get to that. You have been faithful with little. I believe you'll be faithful with much, and he will be with you as you face it, and he will help you through it, and he will help you to shine. He will help you in, in that moment like he was with Chrysostom, to boldly speak, boldly represent Christ, and make a witness. So don't worry about it. If you're in that category, God will be with you. Don't worry about it now. Persecution is a real deal. It's the real deal. It's, it's part of who we are. It's, <laughs> it's who we're becoming. But it's also where fullness lies. Let's embrace it as Christians because where there's Christ, where there's Jesus, there's going to be persecution. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I do praise you. I do thank you that you are so honest and transparent about this, that you warn us over and over that this is where our path lies, that, that, that as we chase you and as we live for you and as we seek you, we will be persecuted. It's just a fact. And so, Lord, help us this morning as your people Help us to own persecution. Help us to realize it and just say, okay, I don't like it, but hey, it's part of the territory. It's part of being a Christian. It's part of my faith. So Lord, help us to be strong. Lord, for those who are dealing with the guilt this morning, the guilt of compromise and fear that, that, that haven't really boldly lived out their faith, haven't really obeyed you in the ways that they should have because they're trying to please the world and they're trying to fit in the world and they're trying to keep their job and they're trying not to ruffle any feathers, Lord. Help them. Help them right now to repent, to confess their sin, confess their fear. And Lord, help them to turn their back on that way of life. Help them to find courage in you. Help them to find the boldness they need to, to embrace what it means to be a Christian and know that they will never fit in this world once they do. Help us in that. And Lord, for those who face persecution every day, who, who just live with the consequences and they just, whatever, Lord, be with them. Give them peace as they look down the road and they think about what could be as things intensify. Lord, and help them not to worry. Help them to realize that they don't need that courage yet. They don't need that boldness yet. They don't need those words yet. That in that moment, in that place, <laughs> you'll be with them. And you'll see them through. And you'll give them the words to speak. And they'll have everything they need 
to represent you well. Lord, I praise you this morning. And Lord, what I praise you most for is this world, Lord, this world applied maximum pressure to you. Maximum pressure. They tried to force you to think the way they wanted you to think, to talk the way you they wanted you to talk, to live the way they wanted you to live. But you refused. And in courage and boldness, you live differently. You live life like we should. And Lord, they persecuted you for it. You are our example. And you are our hope. Lord, you bled and died. You suffered. You bore that cross and the torment that went with it. You were persecuted for being perfect, for being right. And Lord, you are our example. Thank you for doing that for us. Thank you for dying in our place. Thank you for not compromising and not giving up. Thank you for not shrinking away from it and walking away. But because of the joy set before you, you endured the cross. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. This whole sermon series, we've been doing the Lord's Supper because it all fits. It's all about the Lord's Supper. It's all about what Christ did for us. And persecution today, wow, how can you not do the Lord's Supper? Because Jesus was persecuted to the point of death, death on a cross. He was rejected and despised by man. He, He was crushed and beaten by us. And yet he was perfect and holy and we despised him for it. So the Lord's Supper, we do that in remembrance of him and what he did for us. So let's do that today. Hopefully at home you have some elements, some ingredients for today. And uh, here we have our COVID-friendly Lord's Supper kit. So I'm going to pull back the top and get to the bread in the midst of it. Jesus said, this is my body. This is, this is my flesh. And he said, it was broken for you. It was snapped for you. Let's take and eat. Mm. Lord, we do praise you that we have a hard time imagining what it was like that day. From the beating in the square, the mocking with the crown and the robe, and then being ripped off your back, the torture of having to carry your cross and then find somebody else to carry it and walk along being mocked by the crowd. All the way up that hill where they laid you down on a cross and drove nails in your flesh and then hung you up to die. Lord, your flesh was broken for us. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And then Jesus went to the cup of the Passover. We have juice, fruit of the vine. And he said, this is my blood. This represents my blood. Let's take and drink. Lord, we praise you. That it wasn't just your body that was beaten and broken for us. Your blood was spilled out. It was poured out as an offering for the remission of sins for everyone who would believe. You poured yourself out that day for us. You embraced the scorn. You you embraced the hate. And you took everything that the world could throw at you. And you bled and you died for us and we praise you for that and we give you glory and we just ask that you would be with us and help us as we face persecution more and more we ask this in jesus name amen